Colorado is made up of essentially five life zones. We have the grasslands, um, and they're sometimes broken up into grasslands on the east in the eastern Colorado and semi-desert shrublands in western Colorado. Those are lands below 5,600 feet above sea level. Then we have the foothills sometimes broken into pinyon juniper woodlands in western Colorado and foothill forests with ponderosa pine, doug fir, rocky mountain juniper, blue spruce, that kind of stuff in eastern Colorado. Um, then we have the montane, which is from 6,000 to 9,000 foot in elevation. And that's typically the ponderosa pine, doug fir, lodgepole, limber pine, aspen forest move up into the subalpine 9000 to around 11500 but that's changing um engelman subalpine fir bristlecone uh limber pine lodgepole pine and then we get into the alpine so um i live in beautiful leadville colorado i'm very blessed to be able to live here and i actually live in a subalpine land life zone and i have a bristlecone pine in my backyard and my bristlecone pine's name is a tree and it's a beautiful bristlecone and is getting really funky and that's exactly what i wanted in denver you're either in the grasslands or foothills someplace like silverthorne or dillon you're in the montane life zone um, colorado's highest point is mount albert it's at an elevation of, get this, 14,426. Okay, everybody's gonna question that, but as of July of 2019, it was um, listed by the US Geological Survey, and they are the ones who track all of this stuff um, as being 14,426 rather than 14,000 for 33. I had to look that up yesterday um, because we got a question uh, from the Scenic Byways organization as to what is the official height of Mount Albert. The Forest Service doesn't set that. That's actually set by the U U.S. Geological Survey. And that is definitely in the Alpine life zone. Colorado's lowest point is 3,315 feet above sea level. And that's where the Arikari River flows into northwestern uh, corner of Kansas. And that's definitely in a uh, grasslands life zone. So sometimes it's easier to look at pictures. And you can see that in eastern and western Colorado, we have different vegetation in the life zones. This is a great illustration showing climate by elevation. And you can see that this actually goes from Grand Junction to Burlington. It's a really cool graphic. And so with increased elevation, we see temperature decreases, precipitation increases, and the growing season is dramatically decreased. So the Alpine life zone, um, with the combination of the heavy snowfall, the bitter winds, the low temperatures and the mountainous topography makes it the most severe climate in the world. It makes up 3% of Colorado's land mass and only 1% of the lands in the contiguous 48 states. There's a couple of quotes that I love and I always share these um, from Ann Zwinger in her book, The Land Above the Trees. I'm going to show you a couple of my favorite books, and they're well worth the read. Anne Swingers is a little more technical, but, it, but again, well worth the read. Nothing between you and the sky. No filtering haze. No dulling pollution. Constant wind. Breathless. Or a land of contrast and incredible intensity. The sky is the size of forever and the flowers the size of a millisecond. There are no trees against which to measure one's height, no houses or man-made mementos to give scale. The only objects larger than small 
are boulders, a strangely empty land. And then from the Song of the Alpine by Joyce Galhorn. This is um, a really easy read, and it goes through the different seasons in the Alpine. There is no in-between in the Alpine environment. And for humans who live in an in-between size world, comprehension takes time. So the Alpine ecosystem is beautiful, but it can be harsh. It is windy. It's wind, wind, wind. There's almost constant wind. Um, Alpine winds have been recorded at over 200 miles per hour with 75 mile per hour gusts common. There's low effective precipitation. You might remember from that graphic that I showed you that with elevation, precipitation increases. But most of the precipitation in the Alpine comes as snow. And you combine snow with wind, and it's blown right off the mountain and down into the trees. This next winter, watch the mountains, and you'll see proof of this action. There is twice as much ultraviolet radiation and 25% more light than at sea level. The clarity of light confuses one's senses of scale. Faraway mountains look so sharp and clear that they seem much closer. This extreme wash of light and the intensity of the full light spectrum gives you almost a sense of euphoria, and it may be one of the things that really attracts people to the Alpine. Of course, there's temperature extremes. The mean annual temperature in the Alpine is 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Records show temperatures as cold as 70 degrees below zero. You combine that with wind chill, and you cannot expose your skin without instant frostbite. Even with temperatures of minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit and a wind speed of 15 miles per hour, which is a, a calm day in the Alpine, you have wind chill of 45 degrees below zero. At these temperatures, your flesh can freeze in 60 seconds. All of these factors lead to a very reduced growing season, typically three months or less. So I'm gonna go into some of the adaptations. So life in the Alpine survives at the outer and upper extremes in the Alpine environment because it has been rigorously selected and adapted to the harsh conditions that surround it. The more severe the environmental conditions, the more pronounced adaptations for plants and animals need to have to survive. So I'm gonna go into some of the plan adaptations. Some of this gets a little long, um, and I understand if people need to jump off, uh, this is being recorded, so please feel free to get back on any time that you like and, and watch this. So chemical adaptations, anthocyanins. Large portions of the alpine plants are, are marked with the distinctive red color of anthocyanins in their stems and their leaves. It's the same pigment that makes red apples red. They, the reds of anthocyanins can range from the red purples of cabbages, the oranges of poppies, the lavender of violets, the blue of cornflower, and it all depends on whether the plant sap is acid, red, or alkaline, blue. As we all know, plant pigments are always present, but are usually masked by greater amounts of green chlorophyll, and are therefore only visible when the chlorophyll is reduced or absent, or the other pigments are in greater abundance. In most alpine plants, the redness only appears in those cells exposed to light. A common plant in the, Alp in the Alpine is the Alpine avens, and it, with its origami folded leaves, when those leaves are spread open, they're, they're green inside, but when released, they assume their complex folding and only the red shows. Try that this fall 
or even the spring, because right now they're pretty red up there. Um, so this is an amazing adaptation. The Redness or the presence of anthocyanins is most pronounced in the springtime before photosynthesis is fully operative in the leaves. They're a product of carbohydrates stored in the root from the previous growing season. When rapid growth begins in early spring, part of the carbohydrate is incorporated into new plant tissue and part into anthocyanins. Those anthocyanins are capable of converting incidental light rays into heat to warm the plant's tissues. And that's really important in the chilly temperatures of the alpine spring. Those plants that have an abundance of anthocyanins endure cold better than greener plants, and anthocyanin production in an, is an important factor in that cold hardiness essential as an adaptation at the high ele elevations. So in the fall, before the leaves fall off and the plant closes up shop, it, it wants to pull in as much sugar and nutrients as possible. And that's where the anthocyanins come in. The prevailing theory is that the anthocyanins protect the leaves from excess sunlight and enable the plant to store any last remaining nutrients. The reason you'll see more vibrant colors during some years is that lots of sunlight and dry weather increase the sugar concentration in the plant's vascular fluid, triggering the plants to release more anthocyanins in the last ditch effort to gather up as much energy as as they can to get through the long winters. So short stature or dwarfism, almost all alpine plants are tiny in size. We often say that the best way to enjoy the alpine is to lie on your belly. It's a good way to view those tiny plants. And it also is warmer down there. So wind speed and, and pressure increases at height above ground level. So the environment is colder and windier at a person's height than at a plant's height, especially these tiny little plants. So it's warmer down there. So this small size is definitely advantageous to the alpine plants. It keeps them both snugged close to the ground out of the worst of the alpine weather and it requires less energy for the production of the plant tissue so that more energy can be utilized through seed development. The dwarfing typically involves only the growth shoots or the green part of the plants, making the flowers seem larger in proportion. So pre-formation of bud, buds. So my uh, ranunculus is just now blooming in my yard. This is a picture of the uh, snowbed buttercup, one of the alpine buttercups. Um, the flowers of the alpine plants are often begun early in the previous year's growing season, sometimes several years before, and are usually well formed by the end of the summer so that they're safely protected before the winter sets in. Studies of the alpine buttercup pinpointed a cell that eventually gave rise to this yellow flower. It formed in the first year, divided many times during the second growing season, formed a bud in the third season, and eventually bloomed in that fourth summer. So why would this be advantageous to alpine plants? Well, the preformation of buds means that they are standing ready to burst forward at the first sign of warming temperatures. The early flowering leaves, um, the major part of the meager summer swarm for ripening of seeds, which is a process that requires the heat that flowering does not with the preformation of buds. 
there's a very short growing season and the growth of the plant as well as the setting and ripening of seeds requires warmth. But with precept bud formation, the flowering doesn't require the full warmth of summer. This allows a maximum time to ensure that the seeds have plenty of time to ripen and protect the plant's re reproduction. So tap roots, early growth is also made possible because of that large amount of starches and sugars, remember back to the anthocyanins, the store carbohydrates in the below ground parts during the previous summer's growing season. Alpine plants are a little like icebergs. A tiny percentage of the plant is above the, above the ground much like the small percentage of icebergs that show above the surface of the ocean. When the plant is dormant in the winter's low temperatures, the reserves of starches and sugars are not reduced. As temperatures warm in the spring, the accumulated carbohydrates are converted for rapid growth. During this period, the plant is using its food faster than it can be made through photosynthesis and the carbohydrate stores are depleted. Many alpine plants may even grow at a deficit until its growth is about 75 to 90% complete for the season. Then the plant growth or expansion slows and the stores are replenished. By the onset of dormancy, sorry, my cell phone's going off east. Really? That's done. Okay. Um, by the onset of winter, the underground carbohydrates are backed up to the highest level of the year. This gives us a great clue as to the best time of the year to transplant alpine plants for re-veg purposes, which we do a lot with the, the alpine projects. So in the spring and fall, when the roots contain substantial carbohydrate stores, it helps the plant to establish itself and fight the stress of being moved and being exposed to the elements, even briefly. So perennial growth forms. Most alpine plants are perennials. A perennial plant lives more than two years. An annual plant germinates flowers and dies in a single year. With the short growing season, it would be very difficult for a plant seed to germinate, produce stems, leaves, flowers, and produce seeds for the next growing season within a single growth season. It puts annual plants at a significant dis disadvantage when competing for nutrient space space and water, especially considering drought cycles. So a perennial plant can just add to what is already established, depends on a stable root system, and is able to survive without flowering if the season is particularly bad, like the season of 2001 when we had all the fires in Colorado. In the alpine, some plants are 10 to 15 years old before they ever flower. The old man of the mountain or the Hymenoxus grandiflora shown in this picture typically spends its first six to eight years producing only leaves and storing reserves in its thick underground root. When enough carbohydrate accumulates, the floral buds develop and the following year, the plant blooms the seeds mature and the plant dies. Unlike sunflowers at lower elevations, which are annuals, the alpine sunflower compensates for the short, cold growing summer by being a long lived perennial. Another adaptation is utilizing the strong ultraviolet radiation. Like I said earlier, the ultraviolet radiation is 50% higher in the alpine than it is at sea level. So the alpine buttercup 
which we talked about with the preformation of, butter, of buds, um, improves its chance of survival by using the intense ultraviolet radiation available in the alpine to its advantage. So this little shiny petaled flower can actually reflect sunlight onto its developing seeds, that, that little green area in the center of the picture, and can raise the internal temperature of its flower 12 to 14 degrees. That warmth also attracts pollinators. This is really a, a special little pl uh, plant in the alpine, Distorta vibra, and it is, um, viviparous means that it gives live birth. So humans are viviparous. So it has the potential to produce in two different ways. So these plants form vegetative bulbils along its spike. The little picture on the side is me holding a bulbul in my hand. And you can see that it has already started to produce leaves. This plant will then drop those bulbils and the plant is instantly made. It, it gives life birth. It also can produce um, by pollination and seeds, but no uh, distort of vivipara have been shown to actually reproduce by seed, only by bubbles. So leaf and flower orientation. There are whole habitats that exist in the alpine environment known as cushion plants. These cushion plant communities are a perfect example of leaf and flower adaptations in alpine plants. They're low growing mats and they allow the wind to flow over them just like wind over an airplane wing. At the same time, there's max exposure of the leaf surface for photosynthesis. Temperatures are often several degrees higher on the inside of a cushion plant than on the outside. The colder it is outside, the greater the difference. The outer parts of the cushion plant slows the impact of the wind on the inner parts and reduces its drying effect. The tightly packed branches can also cause blown in dirt to uh, sink into those leaves, which helps to absorb moisture and contributes to the soil building. In the alpine, an inch of topsoil takes a thousand years to develop. So th this plant is also a succulent. And um, just like many desert plants, the leaves are coated with a waxy surface preventing evaporation of the pressure, precious moisture, and the leaves of the plant have a profusion of interior cells filled with a slightly melaginous sap, unlike the watery sap of most plants. So very similar to many of the desert plants like aloe vera or jade. So pubescence. This alpine forget-me-not which is my favorite alpine flower. And that's primarily because it smells so good. If you get out there on, into the alpine early in the spring, please make an effort to put your nose into this plant. And you'll smell that for the rest of the day. But it's a perfect example of a plant with the dense pubescence. The densely pubescent plants look kind of a pale gray green a softness that is even more distinctive when the plant is not in bloom. Beneath the various coatings, this plant is just as green as lowland plants. The hairs are known as pubescents. These hairs protect the plant's stomata, which are the pores through which the plants breathe. Just like we breathe, plants breathe. We breathe through our mouth, plants breathe through their stomata. The hairs actually will diffuse the strong alpine sunlight, reducing both the intensity and the directness of that reaching the leaf surface. 
since light levels on a mountaintop are so much more intense than at sea level. Although this is not sufficient to upset photosynthesis, it may cause cell damage if combined with the high reflection from like a rock or a snow surface. Those same insulating hairs can measurably reduce water loss and that's of immense value in these areas with sparse moisture and high winds. While the hairs reflect visible light rays, they trap heat rays, warming the surface of the plant in the greenhouse-like effect. When the alpine forget-me-not is not in bloom, it looks much like a little elfin earmuff. And because of the spuriness, the alpine forget-me-not is one of the earliest flowering plants at very high elevations. So some alpine plants, like this alpine poppy, which is one of our rare plants, have dark hairs on their buds, which absorb even more heat than the white hairs, warming the developing flower within. So there are lots of non-flowering plants in the alpine, uh, lichens, mosses, club mosses. They have minimal requirements for survival. For survival. The lichen, which are formed from a fungus and an algae, the fungus forms the tough outer layers, while the inner layers contain algae cells enmeshed in fungal threads. The ability to absorb more than their weight of water after a spell of dry weather makes them very resistant in the alpine environment. Mosses, too, are sponge-like. They curl their leaves really tightly against their stems when they're dry, like in that first picture, and then unfold themselves to absorb the moisture through their whole leaf surface during rain or even heavy dew. Mosses are non-vascular plants that absorb water and nutrients mainly through their leaves and harvest carbon dioxide and sunlight to create food by photosynthesis. Mosses and lichens both reproduce through spores, not seeds, and they have no flowers. So grasses and sedges are very common in the alpine. They have narrow leaves and stems, and they are not likely to be torn by those alpine winds. Often they're the tallest things up there. The flowers are reduced to essentials. There's no bright petals or cup sepals, just reproductive parts enclosed in a simple protective envelope. So here is the test. Okay, what's this plant? Alpine forget-me-not, and it has adaptations of pubescence and dwarfism. This has leaf orientation, the rosette form, and succulents. This one has chemical adaptations, anthocyanins, and this one has both the preformation of buds and the heating of seeds by reflecting UV rays. So I'm going to go into some alpine fauna. So animals are also have to be adapted to this harsh alpine environment. Their life cycles may be stretched over several seasons, the larval stages being accomplished over several summers instead of a month. Litters and broods tend to be small, usually one or two, and maturation it, at a, and sorry, they mature at a quickened rate. So insects. Insects are incredibly important as pollinators on the tundra, especially flies. At lower elevations, you're going to see bees as a primary pollinator, but bees are immobilized at temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. With their lower energy requirements and the ability to work under restricted conditions, flies assume considerable importance in the alpine region and often when you stop for a moment, you're covered in flies in the alpine. And, and that's because they're really necessary to help as pollinators. So bees are just amazing creatures. And 
if you get a chance to sit down and hang out for a while, watch the bees. If a cloud comes over and blocks that warm sunlight, often a bee flying around or pollinating up there will just drop out of the sky and will lay down in, down in the tundra, shaking and shivering, they're shunting blood to their abdominal region to raise their body temperatures. So you'll see them down there going zzz, 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 and that's to raise their body temperature so they can fly again. Amazing adaptations. So birds, there's a number of birds um, in the Alpine, but, but it's really typically pretty small. Um, they are often passing through. Sometimes you'll see whole flocks of bluebirds just passing through, grabbing the seeds they like and heading out of, of the alpine. So the only bird that lives in the alpine all year is this bird. And I'm hoping you guys can all see it. It's a ptarmigan. So they can sit out a storm with relative security. They're typically nestled down into the snow in a group. Um, and so the individuals lose very little body heat. They'll often, the adults will encircle the young to protect the young from the cold. So in this picture, how many ptarmigans, oh, not that one, there we go. How many ptarmigans can you see in this picture? Probably not very many on that tiny screen you're looking at, but there are at least four ptarmigan in this picture. Their predators in the alpine are typically birds of prey that hunt by sight. And because these ground nesting birds, when they are threatened, they will just stand still because they're normally thinking that they're, they're threat is coming from birds of prey and they'll just stand still. So they are very easy prey for our off-leash dogs. This is one of the topics you can bring up with um, the folks that are out there on the mountain to help explain why it is so necessary to have dogs on leash. The ptarmigan is now considered a sensitive species and is moving towards the endangered species list. And let's do everything we can to try and protect those animals, those birds. So, oh, there's my, these are the, the um, term again that I found in that picture. So large mammals. I'm sure that you can all identify these large mammals. Um, many, individuals who are out there climbing on the mountains can't. And it's very fun to actually, um, when they're out on the mountain and they're like, oh, hey, look at that bighorn sheep, to help them understand that that's actually a mountain goat. Um, they don't typically spend the entire year in the alpine. Uh, their grazing opportunities are very limited in the winter and their ability to move around in deep snow can be very challenging. So mountain goats. So there is no evidence that mountain goats inhabited Colorado before historical times, during historical times. Um, they should be considered non-native to the state. Uh, likewise, most authorities consider mountain goats to be an introduced species in Colorado. They're sure-footed and agile creatures. They're at home on rocky ridges, precipitous cliffs and high alpine tundra, they seek the high altitudes to avoid predators. Their hooves are adapted to that, those rugged slopes by being really flexible, almost like rubber, so they can jump from rock to rock and not slip. They are herbivores. They eat grasses, herbs, sedges, ferns, mosses, twigs, leaves, and, and such. They have thick white fur to keep them warm in the winter and shed one of their layers during the warmer summers. You'll often see them, they almost look like, like unicorns with this long mane and it is actually their shed occurring. 
Um, they typically reside on very steep mountain um, and that is not without risk. Mountain goats are often killed by avalanche in winter. Um, you'll often see the skeleton of a mountain, mountain goat down at the bottom of an avalanche slope. Their skeleton is actually arranged in such a way that they can put all four of its hooves on a ledge that is smaller than the size of a dollar bill. Mountain goat males are called billies and females are called nannies. They're not actually goats. They are more closely related to antelopes and, part, and are part of the Bovidae family. So bighorn sheep. Suitable habitat for bighorn includes steep broken terrain, um, which serves as a scape cover and vegetation types that provide high visibility and forage such as grassland and alpine tundra. They're primarily grazers, but they can consume browse like trees. Um, if they have special hooves, they have an excellent sense of balance and strong legs that help them to climb the steep Rocky Mountains. They're well adapted to deep snow. Therefore, winter snowpack, sorry, they're not well adapted to deep snow. Therefore, the, the winter snowpack can really limit their distribution and their survival. Their digestive system actually acts as a survival mechanism. They have a complex four-part stomach and it allows the sheep to gain really important nutrients from dry, hard forage like lichens. They'll eat large amounts of vegetation very quickly and then retreat back to the cliffs or the ledges. Here they can thoroughly rechew and digest their food away from the possibility of predators. Brooming is a term that's used to describe the chipping and fraying of the horns on a, on a ram. Um, it's usually caused by fighting. Some brooming may be caused by accidents or by digging. The rams achieve full curl at an age of about seven or eight. Lambs are born in April through July with a peak in late May, early June. So right now, their, their lambing season is peaking. Ewes can usually live 10 to 12 years. Rams seem to have a somewhat higher mortality rate and it might be that, that fighting that they do. So in the fall, the rams will compete for ewes by having budding contests. They charge at each other at speeds of more than 20 miles per hour their foreheads crashing with a crack that can be heard more than a mile away. These battles may last as long as 24 hours. A Rocky Mountain Bighorn ram, Ram's horns can weigh up to 30 pounds. If you've ever found a skull of a bighorn out in the mountains and you think, oh, I'm gonna put this in my backpack and take it home, you got another thing coming because those things are heavy. I found several in my years. So if you get a chance, check out this video. It's um, by Banff National Park and it's available on um, YouTube. So take, it, take a look at it. It's really cute and it describes the differences between um, sheep and goats. Sheep and goats. So small mammals. There are significantly more small mammals that remain in the Alpine all year and survive the winter by storing massive quantities of food, hibernation, and the incessant hunting that you'll see them doing during the summer months. So this is a pika. It is in the rabbit family. Oops, sorry, went, went too far. It is in the rabbit family. They have really tiny little ears, so they've diminished in size from the typical rabbit, and then they're a little less likely to freeze. Their tails, ears, and their other extremities 
are subject to rapid heat loss and they are um they actually have fur i keep doing that sorry guys um they actually have fur on their feet which allows them to move around on the precipitous uh rocks and and also helps to keep them warm they have they can be discovered by their little dens and they'll have these little Lilliputian haystacks, sometimes pretty big at their doorsteps. They begin preparing food for the winter by mid-July and continue until all available food is snow covered. You remember me talking about the anthocyanins in plants, that chemical adaptation? Well, here's a continuation of that cycle. Pika gather inordinate amounts of alpine avens because those same anthocyanins help to prevent mold and bacterial growth in their food stores. And until the plants are dry, those anthocyanins are poisonous to pika. They have a vegetarian diet that's not very high in calories. It must fill its stomach almost hourly to meet its energy needs. Think about those long winters. How much storage do they need? They need a lot. It's another reason to explain just how important it is to keep your dogs on the leash. These little guys sound a little bit like a squeaky toy. And well, more than a little bit, sound a lot like a squeaky toy. And just being chased is going to utilize tons of calories even if they're able to get away into the crevices of the of the talus they've just expended an, an inordinate amount of calories that are necessary for them to survive during the winter so they're sensitive to warm temperatures in the summer and are thought to select talus habitats that provide a cool refuge during the warmer summer months um, they may the summer, the increasing temperatures that we're seeing may be particularly dangerous to pika as um, extended exposures of temperatures above 80 degrees can be lethal to these little creatures. They can regulate their temperatures by resting under the talus, and, but those increased summer temperatures could re reduce their ability to collect enough vegetation to survive the winter and the ability of juvenile pikas to leave the talus where they were born to find territory in another talus patch. Pikas can die in six hours if they are exposed to temperatures above 77.9 degrees Fahrenheit. If individuals cannot find refuge from the heat, they, those warmer temperatures with just a four degree body temperature increase will kill the pika. In order to obtain maximal food value, pikas, just like rabbits, are able to re-ingest their fecal matter, which is very high in protein and protein content and energy. So pika also preserve their body moisture in dry climates by depositing almost crystalline ureic acid. So they're basically peeing crystals. And that leaves that white nitrogenous salt deposit that you'll often see on the boulder surfaces up there. They've been observed to be active during every month of the year. And there is no evidence that they hibernate. They have to spend the months of July through September storing enough food for nine or 10 months of eating hourly. Pika females will give birth to a litter in the spring and she will immediately get pregnant again. If that first litter does not survive due to predation, cold, or disease, she'll deliver a second, that second litter. But if the first litter survives, her body reabsorbs the fetuses. Amazingly adapted animals. So everybody knows this guy, this is a marmot. They're all over the place in the Alpine. And like ptarmigans, they're comparatively large animals. They're relatives to woodchucks. 
they eat themselves fat in the summer and they hibernate all winter. Their body temperatures will sink to almost 32 degrees Fahrenheit. They emerge in late spring, sprawled out on a warm rock in what seems to be blissful enjoyment of sunshine and warmth, not so unlike humans. So although all these plants and animals have adapted well to their harsh environment, they have not adapted well to the presence of humans, and especially the large numbers who seek out the 54 high points in Colorado we affectionately know as the 14ers. This is why you receive this presentation. I don't know how many times you will have or might you have or will hear oh, the trail's slick, I'm going to walk over here on the grass. Now you have the knowledge to explain that it's not really grass like we have in our neighborhood parks. These plants, insects, and animals live at the outer and upper extremes in the alpine environment because they've been rigorously selected and adapted to that harsh environment. But they've not adapted to the presence of humans. We need to recognize that we are visiting their homes and take care not to destroy it. So stay on the trails. I'd like to say the brown stuff, right? People don't really interpret uh, the green stuff from the brown stuff sometimes, but stay on the trail, the brown stuff. Keep your distance from wildlife. Keep your dogs on a leash. Never feed wildlife. Keep your voice low so that others can experience the joys of nature. That includes keeping, if you need to listen to music, please use earphones. I don't want to hear someone else's music. I want to hear the music of nature. Carry out your waste and your dog's waste from the alpine environment. Don't forget to take your wag bag. These plants and animals have enough to deal with. And as I always say, in the words of the Lorax, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not.